Hello, welcome to Rando Tech Info and another painfully long retread of a video where this lifelong Android user tries out an iPhone. Hello, welcome to Rando Tech Info and today this lifelong Android user is going to share their very measured and uncontroversial and somewhat boring thoughts about the iPhone 15 Pro Max. Hello, welcome to Rando Tech Info and I'm going to be honest with you. I've never really understood the appeal of the iPhone. Gasp. Crazy, I know. Yes, I am an Androider, and because I live in the US, the iPhone is the dominant player in the premium smartphone space. Most of my friends and family are iPhone users, and for the most part, they really seem to like the dang things. And many of them actually used to be Androiders who have switched over and show no signs of wanting to switch back. And it's not like most of these people are entrenched in Apple's ecosystem. I mean, yes, a few of them have AirPods and or an iPad, and one or two of them have MacBooks, but that doesn't really seem to be the draw. And yes, iMessage and FaceTime have nice features to share with fellow iOS brethren, but surely there has to be more to it than that, especially since the Android equivalent of these apps is actually quite similar. There are many messaging apps that are way more popular than iMessage the world over, and the Google Meet app allows you to easily make video calls and it's cross-platform, so it works no matter what phone you or the person on the other end of the call is using. And while I'm still being honest, I almost decided against doing this video altogether. A lot of other tech influencers and reviewers have already done the whole Android user switches to iPhone thing, and a lot of those videos end the same way, with the influencer in question switching to the iPhone as their new daily driver. When people do this, I don't really know what that means. So instead of just doing another generic first time iPhone review from the perspective of a droider, I went about this little smartphone experiment with a specific goal in mind. I compiled what I thought were the five biggest iPhone legends or myths that supposedly make the iPhone superior to their flagship Android counterparts. And over the past several weeks, I have been testing those myths to see if they are indeed true. So without any further ado, let's take a look at Cupertino's latest smartphone offering and let's start with the very first thing I noticed. iPhones are just built better. Not to be cliche, but right off the jump when I took this thing out of the box, I could just feel the quality. The phone just feels substantial, even with the new weight-reducing titanium frame that nobody really asked for. Did I say that? Yes, I did. I love the look, the color, the clicky buttons, the flat screen, the flat sides, all of it. I mean, seriously, people, we were off to a good start. Then I turned the phone on and immediately discovered the first thing I didn't like about the iPhone. The huge oval notch floating in the middle of the screen, or what Apple likes to call the dynamic island. Starting with the OnePlus 7T in 2019, I have been using phones with either very tiny notches or punch holes. So moving to a phone with this thing hovering in the middle of my screen was a bit jarring. And while a lot of people say they have gotten used to the island, I never did. Now, I know why it's there. There's some pretty substantial and admittedly impressive cameras and sensors under that notch, all of which make Face ID, Apple's ultra-secure face recognition technology, possible, amongst other things. But that technology does come at a cost, and having this noticeable black oval sitting in my display, at least for me, did make this phone feel a bit antiquated. Moving back into the positive, I did like everything else about the display. It's sharp, smooth, and is plenty bright to be seen outdoors. However, you can basically say the same thing for any other flagship phone in 2023 as well. And that also goes for the speaker, haptics, and call and mic quality. Yeah, these things are great on the iPhone, but they're pretty great on all other flagship phones as well. Now, the iPhone does have some advantages over most of their other smartphone flagship counterparts, and those advantages focus on durability. The earlier mentioned titanium-infused frame should make the phone a bit more durable with drops. Although I would argue it's the glass that usually gets damaged in a drop, not the frame. But there are some who might argue that the iPhone has the advantage here as well, and that ceramic shield is more durable than Gorilla Glass Victus. And while the iPhone has the same IP68 water and dust resistance as most other flagship phones, Apple claims the iPhone 15 Pro can be submerged in up to 6 meters of water for up to 30 minutes, which is well above the 1 meter of water that is required for the IP68 rating. For comparison, Samsung's S23 Ultra is only rated up to 1.5 meters of submersion, so I do think it's fair to say that the iPhone does have better water resistance than most other flagship devices. Now, does any of this matter? Obviously, that is up to you, but if we are just trying to answer the question that iPhones are built better, and if we are just looking at the numbers and the bill of materials, there's an argument to be made that they are. So to answer this question definitively, I asked myself, are there any mainstream smartphones out there that are built better than the iPhone? And I have to say, no, I don't think there are. So I'm actually going to give this one to the iPhone. Myth confirmed. So yeah, the hardware quality is there, but what about software? And that leads us right into our second myth. iPhones just work. Now, no phone is perfect, and they certainly all have some jank and jitters, 
but my experience with the iPhone proved to be more janky and jittery than most. In my time with the 15 Pro Max, I consistently ran into issues with file and contact sharing, Bluetooth connectivity, and just audio in general and it often took me several tries to connect to some of my Bluetooth earbuds. Hell, sometimes my second generation AirPod Pros lost connectivity with the phone, and when they did lose connection, I had to restart the phone to get them to connect again. Oh, and I also had my fair share of lockups, which also required restarts. Now, you could argue that I was using the phone right after release and that all phones have issues when they first come out, and while that is true, none of the other phones I have reviewed this year have even come close to having as many issues as I had with the iPhone. Now, I completely understand the origins of this myth. Android phones used to be all kinds of buggy, and I have no problem believing that back in the day, iPhones were a more solid and safer option when it came to software and day-to-day -day use. But I think those days are long gone, as are the days of the iPhone just working. No air quotes. So I'm going to call this myth busted. And this now brings us to our next myth, which also involves the software experience. iPhones are easier to use. And this is another myth whose origins are easy to understand. The software experience of Android phones used to be all over the place. Each phone's UI looked and felt completely different, and let's be honest, a lot of them just weren't that good. For example, Samsung's TouchWiz skin was so bad it drove me into the open arms of the Essential phone and its stock Android experience despite all of that phone's other shortcomings. But today, this is simply no longer the case. Once again, using Samsung as an example, TouchWiz has been replaced by One UI which for me, over the last three years of use, has provided an almost completely glitch-free, smooth, and feature-rich user experience. And I feel like this can be said for most Android phones nowadays. From the pleasing and playful tones of Material U on the Pixels, to the minimalist vibes of the Nothing Phone, Android operating systems have come a long way. And in many ways, I think they are actually easier to use than the modern-day version of iOS. For example, if I want to change the camera settings on any of my Android phones, I do it from within the camera app. On an iPhone, you have to back out of the camera app, go into the phone settings, find the camera app in there, and then change the setting. I couldn't organize the apps on the iPhone's home screen the way I wanted to because on an iPhone, they have to be laid out in the grid, which made them harder to sort and harder to find when I wanted to use them. But I think the craziest thing about iOS is that there's no back button, back gesture, or back anything. So when in an app to go back to the previous screen or menu, I had to figure out how to do it within that app. Now I'm sure longtime iPhone users will say the back button is usually in the upper left hand corner of most apps. And apparently for a lot of people, this isn't a big deal. And after a while I did kind of get used to it. But I'm a big believer in user choice and the fact that the iPhone has no designated one way to navigate backwards I believe is an odd decision. Now the validity of this myth will obviously largely come down to personal preference and which operating system you think is easier to use. And that will largely come down to whatever operating system you are used to and because of that, I don't think you can definitively say that iPhones are easier to use than their Android counterparts, so I'm going to call this myth busted. Apps are better optimized and run better on iPhones. And once again, I think this is a myth that has just become outdated iPhones used to have a substantial lead in performance, but that lead has dwindled in recent years. Now, I do think it's safe to say that it's probably still easier to develop apps for iPhone since there are a lot fewer iPhone models than Android models. But these days, most developers seem to have figured it out, and almost all apps run perfectly fine on all devices. I literally tested dozens of apps, and there's only one where there was a noticeable difference in favor of the iPhone, Instagram. Pictures taken with the app do sometimes look better on iPhone when compared to my S23 Ultra. Now this doesn't impact me since I always take pictures and record my videos with the designated camera apps on my phones and then I just post to Instagram from my gallery. But I know some people do like the convenience of taking their pictures directly with the app. And if you are one of those people, then I believe the iPhone will give you a better picture posting experience. Now what we haven't mentioned here yet is that some apps actually run better on Android. Wait, what? Now granted, these are primarily Google Apps. Google Calendar and Google Photos both have features that are available to them on Android that are not available to them on iOS. For example, the Calendar app on Android lets you change the calendar for an event after you create it. On iPhone to do this, you have to recreate the event, and on Google Photos, you can't choose what photos get backed up, the app decides for you. And Google Keyboard, which I believe provides the best input experience for Android owners, provides a very watered down and less fun experience on iOS. Now understand, I'm not even saying that this is necessarily Apple's fault. Google might be the one holding back features in this case, but it doesn't change the fact that the experience of using these apps is still better on Android devices. So to make a long story short, too late. this myth is busted. 
Finally, you know we couldn't wrap this up without talking about cameras. iPhones take better videos. All flagship phones take good photos now, and I think which one you prefer largely comes down to personal preference, and I think most users and influencers acknowledge this. The same cannot be said for video. And I think this is a myth that mostly comes from YouTubers, reviewers, and influencers, and less so from the general public. So I'm actually not going to spend a ton of time on this one. And I'm actually in a unique position to address this myth because I spend a lot of time recording with my phones. Unlike most big name tech reviewers, I don't use fancy dedicated cameras to record my videos, I use my smartphones. I started back in the day with the Google Pixel 2 XL, graduated to a OnePlus 7T, and for the last few years I've been using the latest offerings from Samsung's Galaxy S series, the first of which was the S21 Ultra, and it was that phone that convinced me that I had absolutely no need to use a dedicated camera to record my content. Not now, and probably not ever. These days I record most of my footage with the Galaxy S23 Ultra. I'm actually using it to film this video right now, and for the most part, I think it looks pretty good. Now, after getting the iPhone 15 Pro Max, I did switch to it as my primary camera for a couple of videos. And I can say with all honesty, I didn't think the footage looked as good as what came out of the Ultra. Now, this could largely be down to preference, or it could be that I'm just better at getting the best looking footage out of the Ultras, since I've been using those devices much longer, and that would definitely be a fair argument to make. I will also admit that in other situations, particularly tricky lighting conditions, that the iPhone's footage does sometimes come out on top. But I could also talk about the greater recording flexibility that Samsung phones provide, with their built-in video pro mode that gives you a lot of manual controls that the iPhone's native camera app just doesn't provide. Now, there are some pretty great third-party apps you can grab for the iPhone and provide you with some of those manual controls, like the fantastic Blackmagic video app, but I'm still not convinced the footage that comes out of there is really any better than the footage I can get with the S20 Ultra's native camera app, at least in most situations. So once again, which phone does a better job will largely come down to preference, which means by definition, this myth is busted. So for those of you keeping score at home or wherever you're watching this video, only one of our five tested myths wound up being confirmed, and even that one was a close call. Now this doesn't mean that iPhones are bad phones, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you to start questioning all of your tech life decisions. However, the next time you're looking to drop $800 or more on a phone, it might be worth your time to do a little research. The same way you might conduct research before you buy a new refrigerator, dishwasher, or a large screen TV. I mean, after all, it never hurts to be a more educated consumer, and you might actually stumble across something you like better. And most phone manufacturers will have a return policy, so if you don't like what you bought, you can always return it, usually within 15 days. However, obviously double check this before you pull the trigger on any purchases. And oh yeah, just for the record, and in case you were wondering and couldn't figure it out already, this droider isn't going over to the dark side anytime soon. I just appreciate the variety and flexibility Android provides too much to make that kind of a switch, at least right now. However, for full disclosure, even though I'm not carrying around the iPhone anymore and my digital SIM card has been removed, I will continue to use it as a second camera in some recording situations and I'm also still going to use it till I beat Resident Evil Village, which is currently not available to play on any Android device. So I guess at the end of the day, iPhones aren't actually all bad. Well, that's all the information I have for one day. As always, your thoughts and opinions are welcome down in the comments. And just remember, we don't always have to agree with each other to be friends. As always, I hope you found this video useful. Thank you for watching. And until next time, this is Rando Tech Info, signing out.